Welcome to Soundtrack Your Life, a podcast about soundtracks, music, and movies. Each episode features a guest and focuses on a specific soundtrack and the personal stories connected to it. Now here's your host, Ryan Pack. Well, hello and welcome to Soundtrack Your Life. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Pack. Today we are going to talk about the 2001 Baz Luhrmann film, Moulin Rouge. It was selected by one of our guests today. So we have two returning guests. We have Brandis Wilson and Nicole Barlow. You may remember them from uh, the train spotting episode from season one, where we managed to offend, I believe, the entire United Kingdom by making fun of Scottish dancing and by making fun of the Industrial Revolution and by not talking about Ewan McGregor's weight in the metric system, you know, because we're Americans. Um, so today we're talking about Moulin Rouge. Brandis picked the movie um, so we can further talk about Ewan McGregor. Uh, so first question is for Nicole. Do you find him morbidly obese in Moulin Rouge? <laughs> no, that was going to be my line. My opening line was going to be first and foremost, Ewan McGregor is obese in this film. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can we blame the man for being won over by a croissant? <laughs> no, like he was method. He was method, and he just slam noms some croissant. No, but genuinely, how do you feel about his attractiveness in this film? Honestly, there are so he's like the moon, right? Like there are phases of the moon. They all have merit. They're all like great, but just different. Right, so the full moon version of Ewan. I am also loving. I am loving the black hair. I am loving that he keeps like a little bit of his Scottish brogue. Great, plus points. <laughs> so yeah, I mean he's a little fluffier than he is in Train Spotting, but that's fine. <laughs> he's not the one dying in this movie, which is also refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> he does cluck in it more than uh, thirty-four pounds. Yes, mm-hmm. more than thirty-four pounds. Yeah, I'm like really tempted every time we talk about this now to like go to a calculator that converts to the metric system. <laughs> but I won't. I'm gonna refrain. I know that he's 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 looking he's looking great. He's looking great. There is like by the way, we all watched this movie this week to prepare for this show. And there is a whole scene where she's like undressing him and there is this terrible like double entendre that I don't remember now that's basically like about his size <laughs> yes uh-huh the size of his like she says big boy indeed yeah big boy yeah uh-huh yeah there it is there it is <laughs> so I'm just saying maybe you gained weight in the right places <laughs> I mean I do actually agree with you I think Ewan McGregor in this film is super hot love the like keeping the um hint of like the Scottish accent and stuff like I have absolutely nothing against him in this film I just don't like him at 27 pounds in train spotting nothing against him also but I have to say like this is peak form for probably him and Nicole Kidman they both look amazing in this movie which is one of the positive things I can say about everybody looks great To that point, I would like to back up and say, technically, I did not choose this movie. I merely said that, A, we should do another Ewan McGregor film so I could continue hating on Nicole Barlow. And two, I said that we should do one that she would also not enjoy as payback for the toilet scene in Trainspotting. Right. And that's why we're doing Moulin Rouge. It came up as a group that we should do Mulan Rude. You can't put this completely on me since I know that you both uh, did not enjoy this film. I think it's the perfect movie for this podcast because, I mean, Baz Luhrmann stuff is very polarizing anyway. Like, people pretty much have an opinion on all of his work. They either enjoy it or they absolutely hate it. But of all of his work, I feel like Mulan Rouge is the most polarizing of all and it comes down to mostly because of the music like people really hate him taking all the different anachronistic um songs and then mashing them up and so I think it's a really uh interesting thing to discuss just because people get really angry about it (laughs) I, I I don't even know how to feel I'm somewhere beyond anger like, I've, I've got that, like, pentatonics irritation <laughs> happening right now, right? And I feel like I just really need to express some, uh, really need to get this off my chest. I have some things I need to say. 
Yeah, I'm like in one of the later stages of grief where like I've accepted this music is in the movie, but I still just want to understand why. <laughs> That's what I feel like we need to do. This is almost like a therapy session. I am so outnumbered. I mean, as with my mantra for life, my answer was why not? <laughs> That's my reply to that. I wholly enjoy it. I mean, as with all Baz Luhrmann films, I think it is deeply flawed and there are some specific issues with it. And it's a lot. Like he throws everything at the wall and edits nothing. But I still feel like it's a really fun riot as a movie and also as a soundtrack. I'm going to go out and say it. I actually own the soundtrack, guys. Um, wow. I Yes, I like thoroughly Choose death. It. Choose death. Choose death. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy it in like a totally like why not uh, spirit. Like, I'm so glad that you enjoy it genuinely because I can only enjoy it ironically and come from the perspective of someone that wants to shit on it a lot. <laughs> so, and I did really enjoy it in the year 2002. And now I have a lot of regrets and a lot to say to my former self. It's kind of like looking back at like all the things that you wore in 2002. It's the same feeling where you're like, wow, low rise jeans and whale tails and chunky highlights were really like a thing for me. And well, so the early, movie. Yeah, the early 2000s just around the board from like the music to the fashion to like everything is just like that was a moment in time. Those were choices. We made them. <laughs> choices. <laughs> we don't know why we made these choices, but we made these choices. But I feel like. Moulin Rouge as a whole is less a statement about 2002 and is more just like a Baz Luhrmann thing. Like that's kind of inherently all of all of his films. But I also kind of feel like this is the sort of movie that would happen if you locked a bunch of high school thespians in a room and had them like snort pixie sticks for 48 hours. Like this is what they would do, right? With that kind of power. <laughs> it's just really batshit insane and really really 2002 which makes me regret a lot of my choices because I know in 2002 I was down with this movie oh, this movie was great now I'm not so sure because watching it this week as an adult <laughs> is a different experience <laughs> like it just really it really pushed a lot of my buttons and I know we've talked extensively about how you couldn't handle all the poop scenes and train spotting I had to fast forward so hard through that like a virgin scene. That like a virgin scene is disturbing and terrible. It is so hilarious. Like the choreography of that. And then also too, like when I watched this, I was in like junior high, I think in Texas. So like of all the places you don't want to be in a movie theater when like two dudes belt out like a virgin is in Texas. And so like... <laughs> That moment of watching this movie for the first time will always stand out in my mind. I think it is hilarious. Like, I love that whole routine. So I always imagine Brandis in her Texas youth coming from, like, that footloose town where they don't allow <laughs> dancing. So I'm surprised that they even got this movie and allowed it to be shown at, like, your local cinemaplex between the two cows. They don't even have movies in the local between two cows uh, areas. So I did have to travel a bit just to get to a movie theater. And I'm sure it was rated R and I probably like snuck in somehow. Actually, it's PG-13. Oh, well, I was... Baz Luhrmann tried real hard to keep it PG-13. I was uh, maybe 13 then. <laughs> I don't know. That would require math. And I don't feel like doing math right now, but... I was definitely right in that target area when I saw it. I am in the opposite side of the camp. I still think it's an absolute fun riot and so much fun to watch. So there, I, I agree. There are parts of it that I find fun. I don't hate it on like a you hating train spotting, like I never want to watch this again type of level. There are scenes that I feel like really work. I think that it's, you know, a, a well put together film. It's definitely like very boss, but... It's also a musical, and if you know anything about me, which both of you do, <laughs> you probably know that I don't like musicals very much. I don't know. Yeah. Though. That's like the interesting thing is I actually hate musicals. I think there are two musicals that I enjoy, and this is one of them. But I think that because it's so absurd and ridiculous, I think that that's why I can handle it being a musical. Because so the whole, like, I've never bought the whole, like, why are people singing? And it's like, well, they're just so happy and, like, 
they have so much emotion they can't express in any way but in song. I'm like, that makes, that's nonsensical. But like when you're talking about this level of everything is nonsensical, then it works. Yeah, it's just amazing to me the uh, differences between our opinions on musicals, considering that you were like this Nine Inch Nails fan in the leather jacket as previously <laughs> discussed. And I am probably like markedly sunnier, a little sunnier <laughs> most of the time. And yet I feel like there are just some dumbass things in this musical. <laughs> I'm like, I'm way too cool for this. But like, I think a lot of it also goes back to what Ryan said earlier, which is it, it's I think it's kind of divisive, right, to um, put all of these jukebox style like pop songs, popular songs in a movie like this and then like shake them up in this weird cocktail of madness. It's different than like a Romeo and Juliet in that way, because you're you're going to have different reactions and it all goes so fast that you don't even have time really to like (laughs) feel the disgust or the pleasure (laughs) of hearing a particular song. Like, it's so madcap. And I think um, I, when I was looking stuff up for this, I was like, musicals, okay, it's weird that this isn't like a stage musical. Fun fact, it actually is. They made one. Did you guys know this, that there's actually a Moulin Rouge Broadway musical? I did not. No, but it. not. I didn't, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, it totally makes sense because that's how I feel like all of his films are, are like, stage productions that have been filmed I feel like that's just kind of like his style so it totally makes sense that you would then make a stage production of the film of the stage production I mean that's how he kind of introduces the film too right like the curtain draws back in the orchestra yeah for sure yeah the way that it's described in the vulture article that I found is if you've ever fallen down a youtube rabbit hole of collegiate acapella competitions which trust vulture I have not fallen down that rabbit hole expect a similar vibe and it has new songs that apparently are not in the movie like new mashups so some of the same things and then some new things like for example uh such great heights from the postal service no yeah facts uh don't speak by no doubt Uh. (laughs) ryan is dying (laughs) i love it I want to keep reading them out because I know it's going to make him so unhappy. Firework by Katy Perry. Oh, no. No, no, no. no that's, no. Uh, that's, that's very on brand for this film, I think. No, it's not. That's terrible. That's I don't offensive. know how they got even like a few bars of any of these songs, but whatever. Diamonds by Rihanna. Eh. I guess that's that too cool sense. for this. Yeah. Uh, Royals by Lord is in it. Okay. That's odd. Uh, Ride With Me by Nelly. What? <laughs> Is that for when they go on the elephants? I don't know. I can't even picture like where that would fit in. I know. So the brief was find the oddest songs from the different corners of like the music catalog and find a way to mix them together. Let's just jam more songs into this musical. Essentially, like it, let's just put more on top of more because that's kind of what this whole concept is it's it's like a ma- it's a more is more type of thing yeah i don't think i found a single jukebox musical that i've enjoyed yeah i don't really enjoy them either and i i think it's because there's just there's just no time to feel any kind of emotional response and all you can feel at the end of it is just kind of like this weird whiplash like it's the same reason that i can't do uh, a cappella stuff right because it's just like you just feel weird like listening to an acapella pentatonics version of like it always goes back to the pentatonics I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so offended that we're comparing this to acapella right now i'm sorry but it's it's this is actually relevant for once <laughs> <laughs> for once i'm not just throwing it in to be mad at you <laughs> Ryan, you're going to have to do like a recap recap of like excerpts of our few like past recordings in order for this episode to make sense. (laughs) Right. This is like you have to listen to you have to have prior knowledge of both our friendship, uh, which has been like a decade. uh, And you also have to have listened to all the podcasts we've been on. So yeah, the podcast has officially become a serialized podcast (laughs) where you do have to listen to it in order now. There are many layers. They run very deep. (laughs) Like, I I don't think this movie is bad, but I do think this movie might be slightly cursed. And I feel like this is validated by some of the um, quote unquote fun facts. (laughs) 
about Moulin Rouge, which are dark. Oh, I'm sure they are. I don't know. For me, the whole quote unquote jukebox thing, like I haven't heard other musicals that use that device, I guess. So I can't really compare or contrast. But for me, it just feels like a novelty. Like, I don't think it needs to live up to the original songs. And I don't think that it depreciates them in any way. It just to me is like a separate thing. And then there are tons of musicals with like totally original songs. And so for me, it's just kind of like fun to have something different, to have lyrics that I recognize and pieces like coming in and being like, oh, hey, I know that. I don't think it has to live up to the original song. I think because a jukebox musical that is going to be made into a movie because it's going to be expensive already, they have to go for like the most popular songs they know so it'll connect with people like they're not going to be like what's that deep cut by U2 that we can use like they're going to use like the most they're going to use a beautiful day by U2 because everyone knows that and I think that's kind of what bugs me it's like it's these very like obvious popular songs it has to be like something that's going to immediately connect with like oh I know this song that they're singing but is it not like a little bit um it makes it okay and that they're using it in such a different way. Like, it's not like they're splicing and dicing really from those songs with a few exceptions. Like, it's so mixed and mashed up and delivered differently than the original songs that it's almost like a little bit of like, I don't know, it's like a totally different rendition of it a little bit to me. Uh, for me, it didn't anger me. It just, it was just a big shrug. Yeah, I don't know if they're, it's a totally different rendition that bothers me. I think it's that they're sometimes they're worse. It's just worse. Or there are things mixed in that I already don't like and have an incredibly strong reaction to. Uh, another thing that I should probably state publicly is I don't really like U2. And whenever I hear a U2 song, I feel slightly triggered. And, so, and now we have and now we have officially offended the third part of the UK. <laughs> <laughs> All of the UK anywhere associated with the UK. I'm so sorry once again. I know that they are like national treasures or whatever but I just the involvement of Bono is like an automatic trigger maybe I haven't <laughs> forgiven them from putting that album on my iPhone without permission <laughs> oh, I'm still mad about that too I that was that. really annoying but but yeah like just hearing like a little snippet of a U2 song like oh in the name of love is here well it's like somebody showing up to a party that you don't really like that much and you're like ugh, where do I hide from this <laughs> I will say where there were three songs, because like I said, I do own the soundtrack, so very familiar. Um, there were some songs in the movie that aren't on the soundtrack, and there are some movies, I mean, some songs in the soundtrack that I didn't actually catch in the movie. But for the most part, I enjoyed all the mashups except for three very distinct ones that I feel like did not work. And I know we agree on two of them, probably. The Nirvana Teen Spirit and Fat Boy Slim, Because We Can, <laughs> uh, was a hot mess. <laughs> hate yeah hate so much yeah. like it's like a huge record scratch um in that film does not work and then the bono children of the revolution is really weird the two times i think it comes up twice that really sticks out in like a weird way and then i actually have no idea where this comes up in the movie it didn't even register for me but it's on the soundtrack um back at diamond dogs I don't think it's in the movie because I don't think it is either, but I don't like the song. <laughs> he recorded it for, um, and Beck does a lot of covers uh, to varying degrees of success, in my opinion. But Beck loves the cover. Beck has a whole album of Leonard Cohen covers, and they are so weird <laughs> and not great. Um, yeah, the song is fits in that category very well, but I genuinely have no idea where it appears in the movie if at all so i don't know why it's in the soundtrack so let's stay on the diamond dogs thing so in the movie david bowie shows up with the song called nature boy and then there's a david bowie reference with the diamond dogs the dancers mm -hmm. and then there's a piece of heroes and i believe the children of the revolution mashup mm -hmm. But if you're not, like, paying close attention, like, you almost miss the fact that, like, this movie is supposed to be covered in David Bowie. Yeah, and, uh, you kind of do. It's sort of subtle. Um, I also think it speaks to how far in the public consciousness Bowie had kind of gone down in the early 2000s. Like, I really think that his, his relevance, even though he was still, like, you know, music canon, 
Um, I don't think people were appreciating them to the degree that they should have been appreciating him in like the late 90s, early 2000s. That's just my my read on the situation. Also, all of the people that sold their music to this movie that were like, this is fine. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was a lot, right? Like, and this is early 2000s, right? Like, Bowie was like out, I don't know, chilling with Moby and like doing cameos and Zoolander, like slightly different period of time for him. That being said, though, at around this time, he absolutely refused to work with uh, Coldplay on a song because he said it was terrible. Well, he was never desperate. <laughs> Yeah, Brandis. <laughs> I'm just saying, he did know the word no. So, like, this is a choice. <laughs> but it's just, there's Chris Martin and there's everything else. <laughs> yeah. Man, the UK is really going to hate it. <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of people in the UK that do not like Coldplay. We can only hope. <laughs> Shout out to my peoples that don't like Coldplay. Hello. Interactive Instagram post. Comment how you feel about us insulting Coldplay. <laughs> so sorry. Coldplay and you two in like one breath, basically. For people, fans with like enormous fan bases. Also, you're going to get a lot of uh, comments on that one too. All right. So I just want to go back for a second to this film being kind of cursed. Can I just read you guys some of these like very dark facts about this film? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so number one, Boz Luhrmann's father died on the first day of filming. Yikes. So that's like literally casting a pall over an entire production. <laughs> Not a great start. No. Uh, Nicole Kidman didn't just break one rib during filming. She broke two. Was that from them trying to lace up that red dress in that one scene? One is from a corset. <laughs> Heather is from falling down a flight of stairs in heels. Yikes. So both costume related. Great. And there are a bunch of scenes that I guess she had to film like from a wheelchair (laughs) because she was so busted from falling and breaking ribs, which is terrible. It's not funny. It's terrible. She's well, kudos to the cinematographer and editing because I did not notice at all the weird sort of like angles that they might have been doing to compensate for that. Yeah, I think they had to do a lot to, yeah, cover for the fact that they broke Nicole Kidman. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently these injuries cost her the lead in David Fincher's Panic Room. Oh, no. Oh, no. Panic Room. <laughs> she probably would have broken some ribs in that, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> might have been for the best. Uh, John Leguizamo, who plays uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, who was actually actually had like a form of dwarfism, uh, and so like he has to walk around on his like knees the whole movie, apparently, and it caused his legs to go so numb that he had to go to like physical therapy. Oh my god! And apparently, his lower back is like still compressed, like to this day. Like, he barely has a spine from playing that character. How is that even, like, possible? I mean, films are shot in, like, a few minutes, if even, like, mostly second sequences. And then, like, you get up. And it's then... all that method. It's all that method. I just love how, like, <laughs> the one kind of true to historical fact portion of this movie, <laughs> like, the one person who's, like, just trying to be kind of true to, like, a real person, a real French person. Uh, yeah, it's like, th- this is what happened. This is what happens when you try to be accurate. That's the guy that has a stage show called Latin uh, Latin for Dummies. <laughs> Isn't that his show? I think so. And I'm, I, I like John Leguizamo. He's great. Yeah, I can't believe this movie yeah. broke him and not being the bad guy in Spawn. <laughs> well, I might have broke him more on like an emotional level. <laughs> Uh, it's like absolutely horrifying, though. I mean, there are supposed to be people on set to make sure that these things don't happen. These are Baz Luhrmann's rules. I think nobody cared. I think because he shoots in Australia, it's like, I don't know, mate. That's <laughs> throw another shrimp on the bobby. <laughs> this podcast banned in two countries. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make that. Oh, that's a whole continent, actually. Whole continent. <laughs> We have the UK, which is three countries, and then now all of Australia. 
Well, anything well, like press is good press. This yeah. is this is our like PR line that we're aiming for. <laughs> Do you have any more accents you want to break out today? <laughs> any former or current British Commonwealth, just brace yourselves for this. Uh, so those are dark facts. Uh, another dark but funny fact is that uh, Ewan McGregor was not the first choice for this. Leo DiCaprio was the first choice for this, but he can't sing. Well, I mean, neither of those things are surprising. <laughs> Apparently he tried to sing Lean on Me for Boz Lerman, like after they had developed this relationship from Romeo and Juliet. And he was like, yeah, I don't think that this should continue. <laughs> Good. I'll bring you back for Great Gatsby. Well, exactly. That's what I mean. Like, he's obviously a favorite with um, Baz Luhrmann. So, like, you knew he was going to be, like, up for this role. But also doesn't surprise me at all that he can't sing. Like, he seems like the type of person who wouldn't be able to sing. Uh, so I read that Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal both auditioned for the film. And, like, Gyllenhaal was breaking out, like, Sondheim songs to show that he could sing. Yeah, which uh, is extra. Hmm. And then Heath Ledger was so mad he didn't get the part because he was considered too young that he refused to work with Boz Luhrmann for Australia. Wow, I didn't realize that he banned Boz after that. That's some Australian beef right there. That's crazy. And then, um, So also up for the role was Tim Wheeler from the Irish band Ash, which I didn't know about. Hmm. Wow, I mean, that would have been a dark horse type of choice. <laughs> Ash, a band that barely, a, a, a band that was like pretty big in the UK, but never made it big stateside. The lead singer from that band was up for the role of Christian. So interesting. They definitely cast a wide net. I think Ewan was a good choice. And I'm not saying that because you guys know my feelings about him. But I think he is a really competent singer. I think Nicole Kidman does a really, a really competent job with it too. Like they mm-hmm. both pull it out. Yeah, I can't see this. I mean, obviously, it's hard to say, like, after you've seen the movie, obviously, a few times, and it's like, they are those roles, but I can't really see it with anyone else. I think that in addition to, like, the singing, McGregor does a really good job of, like, that naivety that you have to have, especially for, like, the elephant scene of, like, him absolutely not realizing that there's a mistaken identity and she's trying to, like, sleep with him while he's trying to deliver poetry. He has that, like, goofy smile on his face and just, like, does not understand what's going on. I think he pulls off, like, really well. And then Nicole Kidman is obviously just like the full embodiment of Satine. And she has like this whole cult following because of that. So I think the casting was like spot on. I like this transformation of Ewan McGregor from heroin addict to like (laughs) very pure leading man. (laughs) Right? He's so pure in this film. (laughs) Um, That's called range. (laughs) I feel like he does that in Big Fish as well. And even like Down With Love. Oh, yeah. This is very similar to his character in Down With Love for me because they're both very, um, yeah, wide-eyed, let's mm-hmm. say. Although in this movie, he is kind of the world's biggest virgin. She's undoing his pants and he still doesn't understand what's going on. He has no clue what's going on. I'm just kind of like, you're 30, <laughs> I thought, in that scene. Yes. And he knows she's a prostitute. So, like, I mean, come on. He knows, but I, it's kind of like he hasn't been introduced to the concept of prostitutes. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, he's probably like, I haven't paid anything, so. (laughs) That's what it was. That's why you nailed it. Now everything makes sense. No trend. She can't seduce me because I haven't paid her yet. (laughs) But he did have that black tar heroin in his pocket, so. (laughs) (laughs) I need to stop with the train spotting callbacks because people are like, what the fuck? That's not the thing they signed up for. I die every time that he screams out, screams out because she doesn't love you. Every single time, I'm like, "You stupid idiot!" It's like this wonderful uh, Phantom of the Opera moment that just like gives everything away. I mean, how the Duke is not wise to like what's going on before Nina, the asshole, tells him, I don't know. But still, he just gives everything away in that moment, and it's like really true to his like again wide-eyed, naive character. But like every single time, even though I know it's coming, I'm like, "Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! No, don't do it!" And it still happens. Yeah, well, his character is actually the dumbest. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's a toss up between him and the Duke. Like, <laughs> the Duke, he had to have seen what was going on. Well, there, there is the rest of Spectacular Spectacular that can't finish the line, the hills are alive with the sound of blank. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, too. Do we blame the absinthe for that? 
Right? The way that Ewan McGregor pronounces absinthe too is just also so wide-eyed and naive as he doesn't even know how it's like pronounced. <laughs> no. Oh, no. And then he he's he's like ducking down the like whatever basement hole like, oh, no, I couldn't possibly be a bohemian because my father. <laughs> Ewan, you're, a man. You're, you're a full ass man. Please. And clearly he hasn't seen the video for Perfect Drug from Nine Inch Nails or he would totally know what absinthe is, is like. <laughs> it does crack me up, though, because he, he yeah, it's, it's beyond naive. It's like he was literally born yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's adorable. And I mean, it makes the whole elephant room scene like so amazing too. Like that scene and then unlike you guys, the like a virgin number are two of my favorite scenes. But I do have to say that my favorite moment is the full company tango for Roxanne. I think the choreography on that is just like amazing. It is good. I, you know what? I have to hand it to the choreographers because there are some really spectacular scenes. <laughs> spectacular, spectacular. <laughs> uh, but there are. Like, there are some really beautiful moments, beautiful set pieces. So I can see why people are so entranced by this movie even today and are okay with the fact that it butchers so many classic songs. <laughs> I can see it. Speaking of that, perfect segue into songs that are in the movie but not included in a soundtrack. Spectacular, Spectacular, which is really weird since it's the song about the movie, I mean about the play within the movie, not on the soundtrack, Hmm. uh, which is sad because that part's actually like a lot of fun musically. Queen, The Show Must Go On, not included in the soundtrack. Nirvana, Teen Spirit, not included in the soundtrack, although Courtney Love probably had something to do with that one. Madonna, Like a Virgin, not in the soundtrack, and Julie Andrews, Sound of Music, The Hills Are Alive, also not in the soundtrack. (laughs) Uh, For good reason. (laughs) Interesting omissions. I mean, I'm sure there's like, whatever, business reasons why they're not on the soundtrack. From the perspective of somebody that works in advertising and has to be involved with licensing music, honestly, this whole bullshit seems like a nightmare. Oh, yeah. I don't even know how any of this was possible. It would have been an absolute licensing nightmare, especially since there's so many egos involved. It's not even like, you know, to Ryan's point, like deep cuts of like, you know, people who aren't necessarily that mainstream. You're talking about the hardest songs to get licensing for. So I'm sure that's the reason. It's just super interesting because a lot of those songs that I just named are really big songs, like pivotal moments in the movie. It's not even like, small piece that showed up here or there like the hills are alive it was in the beginning it's not carried throughout but like like a virgin is an entire number in the movie and then like the show must go on is a huge pivotal thing spectacular spectacular is an original song and is about the play and it's not even in there even just getting your song and, and like and having that be like a whole recurring theme like that must have cost them an arm and a leg anyway now we're getting all like <laughs> We're like grandma rocking on the porch. Like, do you know what it costs? (laughs) I heard Elton John and Paul McCartney were not too hard to convince to license their music for the film. But Cat Stevens said no, because it goes against his religion to license his music about a movie about prostitutes. Wow. Well, because he goes by like Yusuf Islam now, right? Like he, that wouldn't be chill. Yeah, so he has a song called Father and Son, and Boslerman wanted to use that at the beginning of the film instead of Nature Boy by Bowie. But Ket Stevens said, hard pass. Wow. Take your movie about hookers elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's a strong opinion. <laughs> oh, well, so speaking of things that can't be or that could never be, uh, there <laughs> was an original uh, casting choice for the Green Fairy, which is Kylie Minogue in the movie, which is great. She's great. Another Australian. Yeah, that makes sense, right? He probably knows her already and called her up and was like, Kylie Minogue, it won't be in a movie. (laughs) (laughs) I need an absence fairy. (laughs) Where are you guys from right now? (laughs) I'm confused. (laughs) Come on down, Kylie. (laughs) Uh, yeah, so she's great, like, in her tiny little can, it's great, like, she is kind of like a pixie, so it makes sense, 
the original person they wanted to play the green fairy was Ozzy Osbourne. Oh my god, yes. Why did that not happen? Actually, he's still in it. They shot footage with Ozzy, and when the fairy turns like red eyed and scary that's actually ozzy and not kylie so like that first of all that makes no sense i know it's absinthe and it's supposed to be like psychedelic and crazy but like would they have put ozzy in the same costume like how would that have even if he were full on the fairy like what would that have even looked like yes he should have been in the same costume i'm now mad that he wasn't the green fairy the whole time I think that's the the fairy, and they were supposed to give him a giant sitar <laughs> So I think it would have been a whole other vibe. So Yeah, you see him for a split second, so I'm not sure what he's wearing. <laughs> Ozzy, what are you wearing? I was like, what'd they do to Kylie Minogue? <laughs> I don't know what it says about me that I didn't even notice it. I didn't either. Escaped me completely. Well, I think I was still thinking about Ian McGregor not knowing how to pronounce absinthe. <laughs> Probably. I think I was distracted. Or how fat Ian McGregor is in this movie. <laughs> fat shame you and mcgregor i think we've already established this thank you for listening to part one of our episode on moulin rouge brandis nicole and i will be back next week for the second part where we'll talk about a music industry beef that kept marilyn manson from appearing in the film the oscar buzz surrounding moulin rouge the legacy of the film and much more subscribe to the podcast for all of our episodes and if you want to contact us you can email us at soundtrackcast at gmail.com thanks again Thanks for joining us this week on Soundtrack Your Life. Make sure to visit our website, SoundtrackYourLife.net, where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too.